So here we have is the 2023 investor deck for Henry Shine. Uh, so I coming into this with a very limited understanding of the company, other than the fact that they are one of the more well-known brands in the dental space, uh, which has uh, grown significantly with the dental service organizations and DSO movement uh, in America for the past while. Uh, so it's 93 pages, so it will take a bit of time. But let's see if, um, you know, from the contents of this deck, uh, if it's worth taking a deeper dive into the financials, into the company, into the management to see if this is an investment. So in this deck, we have the executive summary. Um, we have it talking about the complementary software, specialty and service businesses. So I'd like to understand what Harry Shine One is, what are the specialty products, and what are some value added services. It also talks about operationalize one distribution and leverage, leverage one shine. So I'm curious to understand what one is and what is one shine, right? And then, and then what does their digital transformation journey look like? What are the strategic advantages of Henry Shine's integrated digital solutions? What are these solutions? What is plus one, right? And how does it create value for the stakeholders? What are some of the goals? And then, so starting off executive summary, things for the day, leading positions and growing, $100 billion dental and alter alternate care medical products and services and in a faster growing specialty and technology markets. Um, okay, so it seems that they're emphasizing that they are in dental and curious to understand what alternate care medical products and services are and what are these faster growing specialty and technology markets. The bold plus one strategic plan, uh, interested to know what that is, uh, provides a roadmap for long-term sustainable high single and low digit, double digit earnings growth Right, so what is the bold plus one? Proven track record, uh, deep and experienced executive team, supported by highly motivated team shine that is well positioned to execute and deliver on the strategy and financial goals. So here we have the company. We did about uh, $12.6 billion in sales in fiscal 2022. Um, they have over 1 million customers, more than 22,000 shine members. Um, also curious to, what, to know what this really means, right? Are they referring to our employees? Are they um, referring, are these customer members or are these consultants, right? And that, make, that uh, mix between consultants and full-time employees that could imp imply different um, payroll and or employee liabilities in the company. Um, over 90 years in business, uh, 32 countries, right? So these are interesting. As for these stats, right? Six years in SME 500, uh, it doesn't really tell me much, um, right? Or then it's a, you know, one of the leading companies in the country. Uh, in all these awards, I know that some awards are, you know, relatively and fairly easy to get, right? So I'm not familiar with the requirements for these, but, you know, the first five points, that does tell me a lot more about the business uh, than these other four points. Uh, and up here, it seems that their focus is leading provider of healthcare products and related services to office-based dental and medical practitioners and alternate care sites, uh, excluding specialty drugs. Um, so I'm curious to understand what office-based dental and medical care sites are, right? So is this all non-hospital locations or are these, uh, is there a, you know, a, a really specific definition of the private offices or offices that they serve? I actually didn't realize they were in the medical space as well. So I think uh, this broadens their addressable market by quite a bit, given just the sheer number of medical practitioners or uh, providers on the market in comparison to dental. Uh, so I think they are able to, um, perhaps they are able to replicate the success they've had in dental to medical as well. And what are alternate care sites? So key development since IPO in 1995 transformed from the leading U.S. mail order dental distributor to the leading global dental and medical products and service provider to office-based pr practitioners and alternate care sites. I think we covered that in the previous slide, um, but you know we learned that they used to be in mail order dental distribution. I think so. That's how they got started in the century. Uh, to now, what is now a significantly extended position in specialty products, corporate brand, and proprietary products. Right now, now that is indicates higher margin. Uh, given so, I think the business model transformed for having that distribution network to having their own proprietary products, uh, much like how Amazon has its own Amazon branded uh, products or Kirkland, right? So they're able to take advantage of their own distribution network and increase the margins that way. Also, like to understand what these specialty products are, what are these digital solutions, what are value added services, 
and what are medical alternate sites. Uh, so since IPO, the CAGR in the earnings per share has been 14%. Uh, the CAGR in stock appreciation has been 13%. So in the current state, they are the number one global provider of dental merchandise, traditional and digital equipment, parts and services to office-based dental practitioners, number one in global dental practice management software, number two in U.S. provider of MedSearch, vaccines, pharmaceutical equipment to di and diagnostics to medical alternate sites. Um, okay, so they have about $8 billion in dental sales with $1 billion in dental special specialty portfolio. So given that their revenue in 2022 was 12.6, uh, obviously here the majority is in dental. You have $4 billion in U.S. dental medical, sorry, U.S. medical sales. We have about $800 million in global dental practice management soft, so, uh, sales and value-added services. Um, so I would imagine this to be almost more recurring in nature compared to these other revenue streams if they are in, in distribution. And $3 billion in corporate and owned brands portfolio. So, um, but what does that mean, right? What is that $3 billion? Is that enterprise value? Is that market cap? Is that sales? Is that cash flow? I think we have to look into that a bit more. Favorable macro trends leading to increased patient traffic and demand for products and services, demographics, aging population. Uh, I know that for medical uh, practices or medical, medical specialties, very often the diseases are age-driven. Um, I don't know to what degree denti, uh, dental is like that as well, right? Do you get more, um, right? Do you get, I mean, does the ticket price for services in dentistry increase with age? Um, you know, perhaps it is, right? As you get older, if you have more root canals, if you have, uh, you know, full oral reconstruction, you know, uh, implants, uh, that is likely to increase uh, with age. Um, but I think, you know, that is worth doing a bit more research into. To what degree does the ticket size increase with age? Healthcare developments. Movement of procedures from hospitals to physician offices and alternate care sites. So I know this is true for uh, both U.S. and Canada. Uh, from what I've heard, uh, the hospital systems across Canada and the U.S. are financially strained. Uh, there are those that do perform well, but for many, they are having difficulties meeting their financial goals. Uh, and as a result, to manage be uh, better manage profits and financial cash flow, they are transitioning a lot of the uh, the surgeries, a lot of the more day um, day operations uh, to offsite locations, uh, such as private offices or urgent care centers, and, and so on. So with this movement. Uh, and if their marketing is geared more towards medical offices, in addition to dental, you know, this could be a really good trend that they're capturing. Growing awareness of correlation between good oral health and overall health. Expanding healthcare coverage and access to care. Increasing importance of wellness and prevention, untapped patient demand for healthcare services. So how is that happening, right? I mean, where are the untapped demand? Uh, is it just healthcare or does that also include dental care as well? Consolidation of practitioners to multiple locations under common management. This I know is going to be very true, especially with the dental service organizations and also the, the management service organizations for medical service or medical clinics. You're seeing a massive trend, uh, specialty by specialty, starting with dentistry and into family practice, into or primary care, into vision care, into mental health. You have these private equity groups coming in and buying up a lot of these clinics. And as a result, they're creating these very large institutionalized organizations. And instead of Henry Schein coming in and maybe selling to these individual clinics, which you know the sales cycle is about the same for each, instead of selling to you know ten thousand customers ten thousand times, maybe they can sell to ten thousand clinics only through you know two hundred or five hundred DSO organizations out there on the market. Um, so these are so this I think to be a major driver in uh, in their sales and marketing efforts. Increased adoption of digital technology, advancement in practice management software, and electronic medical records. Uh, this I know many clinics, actually most clinics I've ever spoken with in the past, they all hate their software. But to the degree that they hate it, they are also very locked in because the software that they do use, the software is good enough, just good enough for 90% of the uh, operations that they have. And the 10% is really something they just live with, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and you know, seeing some of the solutions out there is extremely dated uh, for dentistry, for mental health, for primary care. Uh, some of these systems are very archaic. So if they can come in and provide a really intuitive, user-friendly, and streamlined system uh, that perhaps even interacts with the patients, you know, that is uh, perhaps a winning, winning formula. So it's good that this is at the very top. 
uh, improve clinical workflow, driving better patient outcomes. Uh, to my knowledge, I think dentistry is not a very high volume uh, clinic compared to other disciplines like ophthalmology. Utilization of AI to improve patient base, uh, patient case acceptance and diagnosis. Um, so I'd like to understand a bit more what case patient case uh, acceptance means, right? Is it that there are so many patients out there on the market that uh, clinics have to be very selective in choosing what case that they take on? Or is it more so towards optimizing the revenue per patient? Um, right? Is it coming from that? Or uh, at the same time for a diagnosis, is that you know supplementary um, information and assistance with the diagnosis and prognosis uh, of the practitioner, or is the software actually doing the diagnosing for them? Right. I mean, if it is, then I would imagine there is a lot of pushback uh, for this, given that the diagnosing and the actual medical judgment is more in the domain of the doctors. I mean, they spent years doing this. I think there will also be a lot of ego at play, uh, protecting uh, that part of their responsibilities. Um, right. I mean, ultimately, the software is going to come and eat their lunch to some degree, uh, and I think they will push back hard to uh, protect that. So. You know, it'd be interesting to know what you know diagnosis actually means uh, in this uh, context or in what they're trying to do. Enhance patient communication. I'm sure you've gone to a clinic where you're playing phone tag, where uh, you know you're calling them, you're getting their voicemail, they're calling you, they're getting your voicemail. So if there's a way that patients can book their meetings or communicate with the clinic without having to speak on the phone, uh, you know, this would be interesting to see in the market. Vision for bold plus one. Um, so, you know, what is Bold Plus One? Uh, customers will rely on us for an exceptional experience, delivering differentiated solutions that make their practices more successful, improve patient outcomes. Okay. So, uh, priorities. So, we build complementary software, specialty, and services. Okay. Operationalize one distribution. What is one distribution? Leverage one shine. What, you know, what is one shine? Uh, drive digital transformation and plus one, uh, right? I mean, I think this is a bit extra. It's not very necessary because everything that they should be doing uh, should be trying to create values for their stakeholders, uh, right? But I think this perhaps might be a better marketing term than just simply saying bold. Um, okay, so building complementary software specialty and services to strategically shift their uh, mix to high growth and high margin businesses. Okay, that's a positive. Uh, provide integrated solutions. What are these solutions? Accelerate both organic and inorganic growth of global specialty products. Right. Well, you know, what are these products and services? Capitalize on unique data to develop additional proprietary solutions. Right. What are these? One distribution uh, global footprint to deliver exceptional customer service, increase efficiency, sales growth, advanced sales of our corporate brand portfolio. Okay, so that's good. And then digital transformation for our customers and for Henry Shine. Enhance personalized customer experience through our global e-commerce platform, advanced connected, advanced connected open architecture, digital workflow solution. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure if there's much I'm taking away from this other than uh, they are focusing more high growth, high margin businesses, but let's see uh, what else they have. So here we have um, Team Shine's unique culture, attract, retain, and develop talent. Suppliers for their solidified position as a high value partner, given their size, I have no doubt they're one of the biggest uh, customers of their own suppliers. Shareholders deliver sustainable long-term growth. Society maintain commitment to corporate citizenship. Um, right, what does that mean exactly? Customers continue to enhance practice efficiencies and patient outcomes. Okay, so um, we have to you know understand you know who are their customers, right? Enhance practice efficiency. It sounds like their customers are their practices and patient outcomes. Do they also own clinics, right? Is that why they are worried or focused on patient outcomes in this case? Right. We'll find out. Harry Shine's value proposition, a suite of differentiated customer solutions, including proprietary products and integrated software. Uniquely positioned to provide solutions for general and specialist practitioners in alternate healthcare setting. So it seems that they are very focused on the alternate healthcare setting. Given their size, you know, why is it not their focus to focus on the biggest or the larger entities like the hospitals, the more institutional settings, uh, rather than, you know, instead of the alternate healthcare settings, right? Perhaps that might be a business strategy then. Uh, I mean, I, I would imagine it is a very active decision they made. Is it because the hospital uh, infrastructure is, you know, perhaps it's breaking down or if you know, it's not sustainable uh, given their size and given the current state of the economy and the market, uh, right? So I think this is worth looking into. Harry Shine's solutions enable improved patient experience, improved outcomes, 
increase case acceptance, increase practice efficiency. Okay, these are all positive. Okay, so here we showing distribution. Number one, global distributor supported by digital e-commerce. Um, okay, here we're showing one, number one practice management software and solution. Okay, uh, I think it'd be interesting to hear some actual feedback from clinics, from doctors who have actually used the software. Uh, oftentimes I know that even if they are the number one in their field, it might be because it's due to legacy, it might be because uh, there are no really other uh, good solutions, or it's that the data is locked in, right? They're not uh, releasing the data in a very efficient or easy manner. So the clinics just choose to uh, live with the devil they know. They know. And in Canada, you only have uh, you know three or four major EMRs or softwares on the market, and everyone hates every single one on the market. Uh, and there's really no other exception that, uh, or no other option that they can use. So I think it's good to get some real live data on, uh, you know, how easy it is, and what is number one to find that is it just volume or is it actually a good piece of software? Okay, and then we have uh, Henry Shine specialty businesses, a leading dental specialty company supported by clinical workflows. Okay, okay. So here I'm not getting that much info. They're probably talking on stage. Here we have the management team, experienced management team. Um, okay, so we have the business. Okay, so we have the executives here, the C-level executives. We have the business, North America distribution, international distribution, strategic business, uh, oral reconstruction. Uh, be curious to understand why oral reconstruction uh, is uh, given its own business line in this case, right? What about implants? What about uh, orthodontics, right? Uh, all these different areas of dentistry. Uh, why is this um, so special? Uh, what is Henry Schein one? Uh, and here we have the digital team, I mean, the very fact that they have the digital team dedicated uh, to that purpose is a very good indicator that they are looking to transform. Uh, oftentimes, you have these really old companies that have decades of, uh, uh, decades of history, but uh, they're so stuck in their archaic ways that um, you know, they don't bother to uh, innovate. So this is a really good sign. And here we have corporate, supply chain, human resources. Uh, so we'll do a deeper dive in their profiles and their backgrounds if uh, you know, we think this is worth the, you know, if it is worth the deeper dive. Independent directors, this is a very good sign. Uh, you definitely want directors that are independent of the company uh, for the most part. Uh, so they oversee the management team on this page to make sure that they're doing a good job, right? So the board directors represent the shareholders in the company. Uh, and the fact that they're independents, um, you know, that means that, you know, at least on in theory, they should be more objective. Right, so we have um, you know very, uh, very seasoned it seems uh, and very well respected uh, individuals from uh, institutions, right? And you know I think let's evaluate to what degree is there a conflict of interest? The United Health Group, rely on pharmaceuticals, right? Blue Cross. Uh, so it's very good that they have the industry experience, but to what degree, if any, is there a conflict of interest? That gets introduced by having these individuals on the board, right? Are these are they the management? Are they um, you know key owners or key individuals in uh, vendors or customers of Henry Shai or you know different parties that does business with Henry Shai? So we have to determine that. Uh, and we have uh, the former CFO of Henry Shai himself. Uh, what I would like to see is you know one or two people that are actually from Henry Shai, so you know they can bring the insight of day to day operations and day to day management to the executive, to the board level decision making that happens. Uh, and I think this is also a very, um, you know, it's uh, there is some diversity, I think, in race uh, and gender, but I also like to see uh, some diversity in age as well, right? I think, um, you know, if digital transformation is a, a focus, uh, that should be reflected on the board level as well with the innovation that is happening in the marketplace and how that gets translated at the very, very top of the company. Uh, key takeaways, uh, they are the leading positions in attractive markets, strategic plan to create operating efficiencies, gain share in faster growing businesses, um, because you know what these businesses are and to deliver an exceptional customer experience. Opportunities to leverage existing customer base and gain additional share of wallet. Proven track record of transformation and solid growth, deep and experienced management team supported by highly motivated team shine. Okay. Generating shareholder value by executing our bold strategic plan. Um, okay, not getting much out of this, but uh, you know it says all the right things. Okay, so build complementary software, specialty services, businesses, 
dental specialty businesses. Okay, so I guess these are the presenters. So this is all the oral reconstruction group, and we also have healthcare specialties group. So overview, solutions tailored to diverse customer needs and price points, and industry leader amongst the fastest growing, competitive, and comprehensive offering, strong, innovative pipeline. Uh, the revenue in 2022 was 1 billion, okay, on a performa basis, right? So unaudited, okay, so that's the uh, fine prints. Number three in implants and biomaterials, number two in endodontics, um, okay. So I'm not sure if these are, I mean, these probably are the different brands that uh, are under Henry Shine operating as their own entity. Uh, I would imagine that they have their own price point, um, right, to capture different market parts of the market at the very top, right, at the very, on the frugal end, uh, on the very premium end to capture every part of the market, or at least that's, you know, what happens in theory. Uh, be curious to understand a bit more about these companies independently. Implant industry, biomaterials, and orthodontic market overview. Growth levers driving strategy. Aging population, right? To what degree does population and age uh, drive the growth, right? Is it, uh, you know, the sheer volume of individuals moving into an older demographic, or is it because, um, you know, they are assuming the same cohort or assuming the same volume of patient demographics, but the per patient billing and per patient revenue is increasing, right? To understand what that really means large underserved patient population okay so where are these people right i mean why are they underserved right now rising consumer awareness uh, greater patient affordability how is that happening uh, increasing number of implant and orthodontic providers okay so uh, be good to know and check uh, are there more graduates that are happening right are we uh, providing more licenses uh, and practitioners to those that have been trained internationally such as in canada or in europe um, is that getting easier already? Is it easier for them these days to become a licensed uh, provider now, right? So good to understand that. Uh, key differentiators, unique solutions and multiple price points, innovative clinical software, cross-selling between Harry Shine businesses, right? given their uh, existing history, uh, I would imagine there is a lot of cross-selling that could happen. Uh, motivated sales force with deep customer relationships across 90 countries. Um, Okay, uh, 90 countries. Uh, if I recall, I think they mentioned that they were in over 30 countries at the very beginning. So be good to understand uh, where these countries are and to what degree of risk um, you know does that relationship provide? I mean, they are as much of a relationship uh, and benefit for you when they're working in at Hearing Shine, but if they're working at a competitor, that relationship might be more of a liability than anything else, right? I mean, that's I mean that's an issue that every company faces. So. Uh, be curious to understand what are you know what is the company doing to ensure that these relationships provide long-term value to the company, even if these salespeople or sales force um, switch companies. Estimated market growth at five to eight percent. Um, okay, so that's a pretty moderate amount, especially given the size that uh, it's at. Okay, orthodontics, biotech, dental, strategic implant, aligner, and software company acquisition. Okay, so uh, what does aligner mean? And uh, what is strategic implants, right? What does that mean? Uh, biotech Dental, rapidly growing provider of innovative clinic software and oral surgery and or orthodontic products. Okay, so that's a good sign. So that uh, is the right way in digital transformation. Sales of 100 million, uh, to what degree is that recurring? Over, five, 700, over 750 TSMs, what are TSMs? 25% sales growth CAGR from 2018 to 2021. Okay, that's very positive, especially given the size of their ads. Over 90 countries, largest and fastest growing implant and custom abutment brands in France. The state of the art manufacturing. Okay. Nemotech, a comprehensive integrated suite of planning and diagnostic software. Uses open architecture that connects uh, desperate devices, offers greater diagnostic accuracy and an improved patient experience. Um, Okay, so why is this position lower than manufacturing? Is that an indication that the majority of the revenue is coming from the manufacturing instead of the software? Uh, potentially, uh, especially if that if it is based in France, potentially that is a smaller market than the North American one. The Henry Shine Clinical Workflow Platform. Better patient outcomes and ease of use of innovative specialty products. Okay, so what is this clinical 
workflow platform. We have practice management system, Dentrix, Dentrix Ascend, Dentally, access patient clinical records, digital capture, interoperability with 2D, 3D, and iOS. Um, okay, I mean, I understand what iOS means. What is 2D, 3D, right? Already talking about the way images are captured. Henry Shine Navigator, powering clinical workflow. Okay, so is this a software where, you know, what, what is this? Clinical planning and design, options in-house third-party service provider or laboratory, fabrication, options, lab DDX, chair sign mill, 3D printing, output products. Okay, so um, I'm not exactly sure what this is. Uh, are they saying that their software does all of this or is it that they're seeing the Henry Schein platform as a company that is being offered to clients, to clinics, offers this whole workflow, right? If Is it that the, any clinic that plugs into Henry Schein has access to all of these uh, services at each stage of the workflow or the user or the customer journey, um, or is it something else, right? I mean, I'm having a hard time understanding or seeing, um, right? I mean, it just doesn't look that it's all integrated into a single product. It seems like it's a, it's more of an overall offering that clinics can, you know, pick and choose a la carte depending on their needs, right? Uh, be good to understand a bit more what this platform is actually. Okay, so here we have Henry Shai Navigator on the next slide. Providing the clinical workflow platform, Hearing Shine Navigator used by clinic dental specialists, general and cosmetic dentists, dental laboratories, Nemotech. Okay, so it seems that this is the software that was acquired from um, Dent, uh, Biotech Dental. And now it's rebranded or it's being promoted to clinics as Shine Navigator. Um, so it's about patient case acceptance, diagnosis prevention, design and restoration, surgical guides, and aligners. Uh, so for aligners, I think that's more of an industry term that I have to uh, look into. So what you know, what is that? Uh, what are surgical guides? Right? And how does all five of these points benefit the clinic or the, the customer? You know, what is it that you know what you know what what is it that they're doing, and what is the way that they're doing it that other people or other competitors cannot do? Uh, so that new tech is you know so much better. Uh, or damage better than the competition. Okay, key attributes: multi-specialty platform that uses that creates unique workflow experience. Cloud-based open architecture allow integration of device and equipment manufacturers. Consistent interface between workflows, customer and patient benefits. Seamless experience for practitioners. Digitalized clinical view of the patient to assess diagnosis, increase efficiency and success rates of treatments. Allow for prevention and earlier detection of disease. Um, okay, uh, so I think. We, you know, it tells us what it does to some degree. I think we have to look at, you know, so we can pull up any screenshots, uh, talk to customers uh, to see, you know, what the patient or clinic experience is like. Is it that much better uh, than the competition or is it worse? Uh, endodontic market overview. Here we have providing a complete solution covering all aspects of the endodontic procedure. Growth diverse driving strategy includes strong market growth dynamics, right? I mean, what are these growth dyna dynamics coming from? Is it temporary? Is it uh, sustainable? New product launches, including advanced irrigation technologies, bioceramic materials, adoption, multiple sales channels, and geographic expansion. Value add training programs. Okay. How we win? Develop and launch innovative new products. Expand global presence and address a broader market with diverse price points and products. Leverage, leverage Henry Schein customer base to grow share of wallet. Establish seamless clinical workflow platforms across specialties. Okay, um, I mean, I think it's saying all the right things. You know, how are they doing that? How successful is the execution? I think, uh, you know, time will tell. I mean, I think we can look back at the margins. We can look at uh, the financial reports and see how this has been translating into performance. Uh, I mean, my concern here is that, um, you know, nothing is really jumping out to me so far that. Uh, you know, it's, you know, I'm not seeing a structural win, right? I mean, anyone can say they're going to be developing and launching new innovative products. Uh, anyone can say they're going to leverage their existing customer base to grow the share wallet. To what degree are they uh, succeeding in that? Um, you know, I think, you know, we have to look a bit deeper and, you know, let's move on. Here we shine one strategic officer. Okay, so these are the presenters. So the overview is integrated practice management solutions. Okay, so this is the software that they're offering, uh, which is generating about $550 million per annum in 2022. 
Number one, practice management software. It provides the entire suite of practice management software, patient relationship management, patient communication scheduling. This, you know, this if it's done well, it's uh, you know, it's very good. Right? It's a game changer compared to the phone system that uh, we have today. Patient demand generation, patient acquisition, digital presence. Right? How are they doing that? How are they generating the demand? Right? Revenue cycle management, claims processing, billing and payments. Um, okay, dental analytics. Clinical workflow, yeah, imaging, digital workflows. Um, okay, seems to be a pretty complete package. Um, the growth levers, driving strategy, create integrated solutions that offer seamless work office workflows, enable DSO growth. Okay, so it seems that their focus is DSO, right? And I think that is, um, well, I mean, this is an obvious strategy, right? They want to service uh, their bigger clients that own many, many different clinics across the country. Leverage one shine for its broad and deep customer relationships. Provide analytics and real time payments and claims. Uh, the fact that it's real time that you know that could be very interesting. Um, I mean, what I know from the medical front and also with mental health, behavioral health, is that it's not very instant, right? They have to chase, they have to uh, call the insurance providers and uh, you know really fight for your payments. Uh, so if this can be automated in real time or even just real time, uh, that could be a really good value add. Facilitate artificial intelligence. How is AI being applied? Right, that's a good. You know, that's going to be a key question. Key differentiators: uh, leading cloud-based software. Right, is it truly cloud-based or is it more of a virtualized uh, environment? Right, I mean, if you have to use Citrix, uh, it's going to be a very slow and painful experience, as some providers do or some software do, uh, and you can't really use it on a browser like Chrome or Safari. Um, so, if it is truly cloud-based, I mean, that's going to be very good. Uh, seamless patient experience, optimization of operations and profitability, marketing security, broadest offering of integrated solutions and office workflows, world-class imaging, artificial intelligence for decision support. Okay. Uh, and it seems that this is having a much higher market growth, and this might be due to the fact that, uh, you know, the older dentists, the, the older owners are retiring and the new blood is coming in. And as part of that, transition they are introducing new technologies they are moving away from a paper-based system into electronic based one uh, and they're adopting new technology more openly right so as a result of that you know that's probably one of the main reasons why it's at a higher growth rate compared to some of the other industry uh, or the other verticals industry trends are driving demand for hearing shine one solutions payment and claims innovation 70 percent of dentists are concerned with declining insurance reimbursement rates that's pretty interesting. Is there in network and out network for dentistry as well, right? Um, I know for mental health, that's a really big decision in a very major city. Uh, you're able to afford to be out of network. Uh, is that going to be the case, or is that already the case for dentistry? Customer dynamics, consumerization of healthcare, preference for all in digital solution and movement to the cloud, growth of large group practices and need for centralization, efficiency, and security. This is going to be a big one. AI and clinical decision support. Dentists seek more accurate diagnosis to improve patient care. Right? We talked about this before. Is this more support, or is it actually stepping in the shoes of the dentist and provider and actually recommending and suggesting diagnosis? Right? If that is the case, uh, there may be some pushback, and there may be also some legal legal concerns as well. Uh, my hunch is that it is not doing that. It is more providing the support because uh, I think the implications, legal implications of that, is you know, too much of a liability for uh, any company. To even think about doing that at this stage, um, but you know, worth looking into and confirm. Dental practice consolidation DSOs actively seek solutions to solve need across practices, from business intelligence to practice management. A single platform to support the growth and profitability of dental practices. Uh, reviews from our customers. Um, I mean, the reviews are obviously going to be good things. Um, but what's interesting here is that here we have MB2, uh, which I have heard of. Uh, and they're a pretty big group, right? As you can see here, as the fat. So what they say here is that as the fastest growing DSO in the country, scaling from 65 to 500 plus practices in less than four years, Jarvis lets us measure everything that matters. Without Jarvis, we would not have been able to focus on the growth. And you know, I think there's definitely a lot of truth in that. Is as you are buying these clinics and as you're buying these uh, smaller operations, it comes with a lot of legacy issues, such as culture, such as you know documentation, such as the way certain, certain things are done that may not be necessarily up to standards or to the way that uh, the platform is done. But if there is a technology or if there is a platform that standardizes these things, that standardizes uh, these protocols and you know the, te the technology is doing that, then it's not as much of a concern, right? So they can grow very rapidly 
without thinking much about the operations and more so on the finances in terms of investment, in terms of growth. Um, I can certainly see that. Technology solutions, how we win. Develop innovative and integrated solutions and service models, including SaaS, that which one shine to broaden and deepen relationships with customers, gain market share in all customer segments, particularly DSOs. Okay, so this is the third time they have mentioned it, uh, which uh, I agree, you know, that should be the focus. Uh, drive fast growing product areas, right? What are these fast growing product areas? You know, let's elaborate. Uh, this is interesting. So we have financial and strategic solutions, right? Are they going to provide financing to the companies or to the clients? Let's see. Uh, business overview, helping customers operate a more efficient practice and provide quality clinical care. Benefits meet customer needs, drive customer loyalty, higher profitability. Primary services, financial services, practice transitions, staffing services, revenue cycle management, education, remote patient monitoring. Uh, these are interesting, right? I mean, the first two, they are acting like a financial institution. Right? Here we have, um, you know, is it lending, right? Is it providing online credit? Is it... Uh, you know, is a prep providing uh, start capital, practice transitions, we are they acting as a broker dealer, uh, assisting with ownership transitions. Here we have them as, you know, as a recruiting company providing staff. Um, so this is interesting, right? I mean, from both, you know, this is that distribution, uh, it seems that, uh, you know, their business software distribution is their main business. Um, but at the same time, these are really good customer success services that they need to ensure their core services are continuing in demand, right? So let's see how everything uh, you know comes together. Uh, ESS leader in revenue cycle management, uh, largest dental revenue cycle operation outsourcing company in the U.S. submits claims and collects accounts receivables. Um, okay, so it doesn't say much beyond that. Um, but also, I mean, this is interesting, right? Submits and claims accounts receivable. So are they actually collecting the payments first? Is the payment arriving at eAssist? And if it is, uh, what is the turnaround time? Are they even, you know, are they collecting interest on that amount that is collected, right? I mean, what is the turnover? Uh, you know, what is the days outstanding uh, that is sitting on the books of eAssist versus uh, going to the clinics, right? I mean, if it's, you know, if they have, 12 billion dollars in revenue uh, or even more than that right because if they are collecting the payments on behalf of the clinics that could be a very large amount that is coming in on a monthly basis weekly basis daily basis and if you're collecting interest on that uh, you know given today's interest rates I mean, that could be a very good sum uh, practice services supporting customers through all stages of practice ownership uh, okay so it actually says financial services here uh, funding is provided by third-party financial institutions for the following products. Equipment, financing and leasing, project loans, Henry Schein credit card, okay, even patient financing. Okay, so this is really interesting because not only are they, they're effectively becoming the 360 partner and the lifelong partner that a dentist can have, right, a medical practitioner can have, from coming out of school to getting equipment and project loans even, right, does that mean they're doing leasehold improvements? or they're financing the lease improvements, even providing a credit card, right? From a financial perspective, you know, that dentist might be fully committed in every single way with the, you know, with the, with Henry Schein. And oftentimes, these are really good rates. I mean, I know if you go to a Bank of America or if you go to, uh, you know, uh, you know, one of the bigger banks in Canada, I mean, all these big banks have these healthcare programs. So if you do that, you know, these rates are, very very low right like oftentimes in canada you have prime plus two prime prime plus three or even five uh for lower credit customers um but if you're in healthcare if you're a dentist if you're a uh you know a physician you're just getting the basic prime that you know the base prime that the bank offers um with the caveat of a personal guarantee right and this is uh you know the cash in many cases is that you know you are guaranteeing the loan that you're getting from these guys you're really tied to um you know, as an individual, as a, you know, as a provider, you're really tied to the company that provides you that loan. And same with the patient financing, right? If they are also financing your patients, you know, they have you on the back end with the equipment loans and they have you on the front end with the patient financing, right? If a procedure costs 10, 20, $30,000 and they're financing that, uh, you know, they're, you know, they're, they have you, you know, from top to bottom. So, um, but also, I mean, how does, you know, how do their products compare to the Bank of America, right? I mean, why would they go with a bank, you know, with a Henry Schein on the financing versus the Bank of America, right? I mean, I think even if their rates, if their cost of capital is even slightly higher than what comes with Bank of America, 
they will probably still go with Heaven Shine, given that it's a 360 solution that they can call on for their products, their service, their EMR, uh, you know, their software for uh, financing, right? And in the day, if uh, you know, as they see here, if they need to sell the practice or appraise the practice, uh, you know, I think there might be. Uh, it's very easy to deal with. I mean, whether or not there's goodwill that gets built, um, you know, between these two companies, um, right? Perhaps uh, Henry Shine can, you know, reduce racing one business vertical or one product and service, uh, given, you know, if the company or the, in the clinic is using other services, uh, that's a lot easier to uh, negotiate and to work with. Uh, so there's certainly that appeal, uh, but also, you know, that gives them a lot of, that gives Henry Shine a lot of power over that provider, that clinic, right? It could go both ways. It could be very good or it could be very bad. Uh, but either way, it gives Henry Shine a lot of bargaining power in this whole ecosystem, which is a, a big green flag uh, for the company and as an investment target. So not only that, they have been a consistent access to capital at competitive market rates for over 20 years, right? I'd be curious to understand and see, you know, how big is their investment portfolio, their loan portfolio, uh, and how has that done, right? I mean, is it uh, already looking to, you know, actually make a bit of a profit or are they looking to have this as a loss leader to support their other business verticals? How we win, continue to provide additional services, both organically and inorganically. Um, what does that mean, right? Are they doing m and or right, I'm curious to understand what that means. And leveraging Henry Schein's financing programs. This is a, you know, this is a very important tool in the arsenal. Operationalize one distribution and leverage one shine. North America distribution business overview. Okay, customers rely on us to provide innovative, integrated, healthier products and services to be trusted advisors and consultants to provide technical services. You have about $8.3 billion of revenue in North America distribution revenue. In 2022, 50% is from medical revenue in the U.S. and 48% is dental revenue from U.S. and Canada. Growth levers driving strategy, full service, and value-added sales model. Robust, fully integrated service team. Customer segmentation strategies for growth. Increasing efficiency and customer experience. Global supply chain expertise. Investment in global e-commerce platform. Broad range of corporate and own branded brand products. Number one, dental distributor. 90% of dental practices are active customers. What does that mean, right? Two to four percent estimate dental growth, market growth. Okay, so that's a so they're saying that the market as a whole is you know it's at maturity. We have number you know they're the number two physician and alternate care distributor. Sixty uh, percent of physician practices are active customers, right? So what are active customers and why is it sixty percent for physicians and ninety percent for ten, dentists? And forty-seven estimate medical market growth. Okay, so why is it that medical growth is growing at a higher rate? Is it that they are gradually more physicians uh, than dentists, um, right? Or are they moving, or are more doctors, physicians moving out of hospitals into private offices, right? So these are, I think, questions we could ask. And as you can see here, uh, we have 50% US medical uh, revenue and 48% dental revenue. You know, I think the sheer number of medical professionals out there on the market should uh, well surpass the number of dentists in the market. Um, so I think. Uh, you know, the market here that we're looking at, uh, you know, this is the medical probably, and here we have the dental market. So this also means that there's a lot more revenue to be had on the medical side compared to the dental side, right? It might even be that their dental business vertical is uh, at maturity and their focus is more towards on the medical side. International distribution business overview, leading provider of healthcare products. Okay. Uh, customers rely on us to provide innovative, integrated healthcare products and services to be trusted advisor consultants. Okay, we've said this before. Uh, $2.6 billion in revenue, 30 countries. Okay, so it seems that uh, Biotech Dental is in 90 countries, and this is in 30. Uh, I think the very fact that they have those relationships in place uh, presents a very good cross selling opportunity. Growth levers driving strategy, superior customer experience, leverage in the Harry Shine portfolio of own and corporate brands, broad range of corporate, I think that says the same thing, focus on multi-site and DSO customers, agree, increasing efficiency in customer experience, global supply chain, investment in global e-commerce platform. Okay, so this has actually been mentioned several times, increasing efficiency and customer experience. This is also a very good sign because they're not just focused on maximizing the dollar amount. It actually hasn't been really talked much on how do we increase the per revenue per clinic, but rather how do we increase the efficiency? How do we make the customer experiences better? Because patients will go to the clinic that has better experience and as a result, uh, drive the business of the actual client of Henry Shine. So I think, you know, it's a good indication that they're focused on 
being a good business first. And word mentality is that, you know, when you do that, the revenue will follow, right? And they're talking about other ways that they can profit or increase the billing or increase the revenue through corporate owned products and services and other um, business lines. But the fact that they haven't lost sight on efficiency and provide good value to their customers from an operational standpoint, that's a very good sign. Uh, okay, so, uh, you know, going here to some stats, we have 650,000 dental practices. Okay, right, so this we know already. Uh, the global supply chain excellence, 99% plus service level. What does that mean? Right, what does that, you know, what is, what, what is, what is 99%? Right? I mean, what is the service level? Over 300,000 unique stocking skills globally, 22,000 unique private brand products, enhanced transportation network. Right? I mean, what does that mean? 90% worldwide customers service next day. That's very good. Right? I mean, that's, uh, these are some numbers that Amazon is, um, you know, is talking about, is, you know, has been working towards. Globally operates out of 29 distribution and 19 manufacturing facility. Okay, do they own these distribution networks or distribution uh, routes? Do they uh, own the manufacturing facilities? Um, but overall, I mean, that's very impressive. And it seems that they are global in every continent, in Africa, in South America, North America, Europe, Asia, Australia. You also see, could you understand, you know, what are the supply chain constraints? What are the vulnerabilities in their supply chain? How has COVID affected that uh, supply chain and how have they performed uh, in the supply chain crisis, right? I mean, we can look at their financials and see you know, how uh, they have fared when uh, all routes and, you know, when the cargo ships were lining up for days or even weeks uh, at the piers. Discussion panel, okay. Uh, okay. So I think these are some of the Q&A that they had when they were doing presentations. Okay, advancing our digital transformation journey. Okay, so I think here we have the digital team. Uh, meaning evolution, uh, meaning evolving customer needs. Today's healthcare provider expects, uh, expects to engage, shop for, and manage their business online as well in person. We intend to deliver on this expectation by executing on our three core priorities digital marketing, e commerce, enhanced customer experience. Our digital investments lead to greater customer retention, increased cross selling, lower cost of sales. Online sales have higher average order value and profitability. Okay, so who is the customer in this case? Is it the providers? when they are shopping for their own uh, products and services or, or you know their supplies is it offering them the digital um, right the digital platform to do so i think i think it is right they are offering the e-commerce platform they're acquiring new customers through digital marketing okay so this is about transforming the sales infrastructure from perhaps a you know in-person sales uh, which it says here but really driven by the online self-serve model, it sounds like, given its higher order value, right? Let's also see you know, what portion of that is true uh, in their financial statements. Enhancing our digital profile, fastest growing prevalence in dental products, search engine optimization, leader in dental products, search engine marketing, leader in dental digital products, um, lead generation, 75% year over year in medical search organization, uh, optimization leading, okay. So it sounds like this is really taking a direct to customer approach. I think we'll have to do some search and a bit of research online to see how they do rank uh, for dental products or medical products, um, you know, in different parts of the U.S. Digital marketing goals, online search and product discovery to attract customers, lead in digital content education for to engage customers, uh, deliver seamless omni-channel experience, shopping experience online in person or over the phone. Okay. Global e-commerce platform, clean water design, personal lines experience, prominent enhanced search. Um, okay, so I mean, e-commerce has been around for a long time, uh, right? As a technology, um, so it'd be good to let you know. Let's take a look at their e-commerce platform, and we'll see how it fares compared to the Amazon experience or other experiences. Digital roadmap: U.S., Europe, Middle East, and Africa focused. Okay, so for this. Geographical area, we're enhancing the current experience and build out infrastructure, website enhancements, marketing technology, AI predict analytics. Global focus, pilot and scale global e commerce platform, okay, scalable global platform, customer focused design, personalizing, personalization, targeting, creating synergies, drive future benefits for customers, business integrations, marketplace. Okay, that's, that is interesting, right? Are they creating a marketplace where other vendors or other 
manufacturers can list their products for sale, like in Amazon, right? And then they have their own brand products, right? That could be very interesting. And that becomes a very different business model uh, compared to what they do have right now. So it sounds like this is at the very early stages. Uh, I think there's still things that they have to do uh, if they're building out the infrastructure, right? The website enhancement. So I think they're still working on this, fine tuning this. Uh, and I think this is about how do you do the lead generation online to attract customers and how do we convert them at a very good rate, um, right? In the US, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And how do we scale that to South America? How do we scale that to uh, Asia, right? And then we're talking about um, you know creating a marketplace where we're looking at something like an Amazon for medical supplies or for dental supplies potentially, right? So I think that's you know that's my understanding of it. Uh, fostering a customer centric culture, uh, CX uh, is that customer centric or is that customer experience strategy? Maximize loyalty, team shine, and about the consistent delivery of an exceptional differentiated customer experience. Data technology extract insights for greater organizational leverage. Global customer experience. Okay, not getting much out of this slide. Strategic advantages, Henry Shine's integrated digital solutions. Okay, what are these solutions? Uh, value proposition, a suite of differentiated customer solutions, including proprietary products and integrated software, uniquely positioned to provide solutions for general and specialist practitioners in alternate care healthcare settings. Solutions enable improved patient experience, outcomes, case acceptance, right? This is uh, has been men mentioned many times. Uh, be curious to understand what that really means. Increase practice efficiencies, how we win, patient experience, right? So this has been re-emphasized uh, and regurgitated uh, many, many times uh, in the past few slides. ESG activities, okay? So over 90 years commitment to our five constituents, uh, team shine, customers, suppliers, investors, society, okay, environmental, reducing our environmental footprint in our operations and supply chain, collaboration with suppliers and partners, social, enhanced our human capital strategies, particularly on employment, recruitment, and retention, as well as diversify inclusion, okay, uh, governance, okay. Uh, Yeshi Engagement, Corporate Citizenship Barometer, a pilot program to gather feedback, okay, material uh, assessment, okay. Stewardship to achieve our sustainability priorities, not getting in governance, Yeshi Oversight with Compensation Committee playing a role, okay, Sustainability Committee, okay. Uh, progress on our ESG reporting, okay. Um, Serenary analysis. Okay, so I mean these are all good. I think the you know, I mean I'm, I'm not the biggest, uh, you know, I'm definitely not an expert on ESG, uh, but you know, from my understanding is that uh, the reason for a lot of these companies to embrace the ESG is, um, you know, to reduce the risk of possible penalties and uh, you know the rationale or the argument that because you're taking a proactive step for the environment, for you know, for the social you know, and governance and, and all of that should have a net effect on. Uh, your company value. Moving on to financial goals. Uh, here we have key financial takeaways, track record of strong performance. We have 12% uh, EPS CAGR over the last five years and 14% over the past 27 years. Obviously, that means that uh, they've been growing at a much faster rate before and in recent five years it has slowed down. And I think that might be a result of COVID, that might be a result of uh, the inflation the economy. Uh, we'll see you know, after a deep dive. Successfully adapted to the pandemic by responding rapidly to initial office closures and reopenings, fulfilling additional demand for PPE and COVID test kits. And if they are in the business of distributing uh, products, then they must have benefited greatly from the pandemic uh, with all the PPE and test kits that uh, were demanded. So for 2023 guidance, we're looking at a 47% uh, sales growth, excluding PPE and test kits. High single digit and low double digit operating income growth adjusting for PPE. Okay, this is good. I mean, the fact that they are emphasizing that the way they think about things is excluding PPE and COVID, uh, that's a very good sign, right? Because they're not looking to mislead. They're looking to be very clear that this is temporary uh, and we should not expect to persist. Uh, and we have a EPS of $5.25 to $5.42 per share. So that's the guidance and long-term goal of a uh, to 11% uh, EPS growth annually, right? So does that, and that th probably does include acquisitions and in organic growth, uh, right? I mean, I think it'd be good to think about what is the long-term growth trajectory of the company if it does no longer do any sort of uh, acquisitions, 
and purely you know, on the basis of CapEx and natural reinvestment into the company, you know, what does that growth look like in the long term? And the growth drivers of our business, uh, our businesses leveraging our distribution infrastructure, right? So this is really the foundation of their business, uh, increasing efficiency to expand operating margin. Okay, so increasing efficiency, uh, I'm curious how they're doing that. Uh, I definitely see the move for them to use their distribution infrastructure as the basis to really grow their other business, you know, grow their new service lines and higher margin services uh, and cross sell across their customer base. Um, growing our specialty in technology value added services at a faster rate than our distribution service. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, focusing on high growth customer segments and increasing share wallet with existing customers. Right? So that means they're focusing, I mean, it, it literally says that, right? Focusing on customer segments and they're looking to deepen the relationships that they have, right? By selling and getting deeper with the customers. Uh, in some ways, I mean, that also uh, makes it harder for the customers to uh, break their contracts or move to a different competitor if you're selling them all these different things, all these financial services, all these products that perhaps other competitors do not offer, right? And you have this bundle service, perhaps discounted to a degree that uh, is, you know, just too competitive for other competitors to come in at, um, right? So, I mean, I think we should take a closer look at that. Providing a broad range of digital solutions and optimizing our e-commerce marketing platform, okay? Um, and operational execution and planning has the word sales growth so um, looking at this graph here, uh, we have a 6%, 6.6% CAGR from 2019 to 2023, okay? Uh, from 2019 to 2020, 2020 is COVID, so that stayed more or less flat, or that would have been the year, yeah, so that would have been the year of COVID, right? Because their, their sales, excluding PPE, was actually a negative 8% change, but then because of the PPE, it was, net, it was pretty much neutral in growth, and you know, COVID lasted for another two years. And that's when the total sales start to flatten out again. Um, okay. Right, so that's you know, that's what I would expect, what I um, expected. So the COVID sales, okay, right? So 2020 was a lot, 2021 was the most, and that starts to dwindle down. Uh, and I think, you know, that'll continue to grow, you know, decrease me by 30, 50% year over year, uh, you know, decreasing by that amount year over year. And, you know, I think people are still getting COVID. People are still, you know, are, they're not necessarily as worried, but it seems that it's not really going away. Um, so it seems like it's just like the flu. Underlying business growth, largely offset impact of PPE and COVID test kit sales on EPS. Okay. So there is underlying business growth. Okay. Uh, 2023 guidance, five to 8% imply increase from underlying business. Okay, so I guess what that means is the 2020 revenue is a bit inflated due to COVID and there is still underlying business growth that is pushing it back up, right? And if we look at uh, this here, uh, it probably just means that the jump in 2021, right, of 22% uh, is really bring forward a lot of the demand into present time, right? I mean, this is uh, a lot more demand than, uh, you know, what we actually need. So as you see here, you know, that's, you know, that's 1.3 billion. That's almost 10% of the current revenue or per annum revenue right now. Uh, so we are going to de see that depreciate over time. Um, and we just have to wait, right, for the underlying business to catch up. Uh, it would be alarming. I mean, it would be not necessarily alarming, but it would be a bit of concern if, you know, in the next few quarters and next year, we see that the, you know, I guess the half-life or the, you know, the rate at which the PPE is decreasing is greater than the underlying business growth. I mean, that is when we have to really reevaluate what is that uh, forward guidance on the increase in revenue, long-term financial goals, sales, six to eight percent, uh, margin expansion, ten bips. EPS growth, eight to eleven percent. Dental market growth, two to four uh, percent. Specialty market growth, technology market growth. Right, I think there's a lot more appetite in the market for this compared to regular distribution uh, products. Medical market growth. Uh, be curious to understand a bit more on what they forecast their mar medical market business to grow at, and not just the market. Converting earnings to cash, uh, net income operating cash flows. So 
their operating cash flow is actually higher than their net income, uh, which is a good thing, right? Um, so they have about $6,700 million of annual operating cash flow uh, that is available for capital expenditure, share repurchases, and acquisitions. Balance discipline capital deployment, we have 2019 to 2022. Uh, acquisitions is accounting for 35%, share repurchases 27%. Uh, this is a good sign. They probably think that their shares are undervalued and they have excess capital and they much rather to buy it back uh, than to you know use it for um, you know, inappropriate opportunities or inappropriate investments. Debt repayments, networking capital, capital expenditures, and this is potentially a bit concerning because uh, oftentimes you know these merger players will look at uh, buy and build strategies for the acquisitions. It really only makes sense if they are more platform based, right? I mean, it doesn't make sense if they are making linear acquisitions to grow their portfolio. Um, but the fact that, you know, the capital expenditures is so low uh, could be, you know, uh, you know, a red flag of a deal junkie. They're doing deals for deal, you know, for the sake of doing deals. Um, so I'd be curious to understand a bit more what their acquisitions look like. Is it more linear or are they actually adding, you know, know how and adding personnel and adding, uh, you know, IP into uh, their arsenal? Uh, and then using CapEx in a very limited way to build on that, right? Because, uh, you know, they like, if you have the know-how, if you can build a business, it's much cheaper than paying you know, 7, 10, 20 uh, times of earnings, depending on the industry that the, you know, the target is in. And then here we have uh, continuing focus on share repurchase and acquisitions, okay, average per annum, okay, three four hundred thousand dollars, uh, three hundred four hundred million on share repurchases, uh, same amount of acquisitions, capital expenditures is only 100 to 150 million, and working capital is only 100 million. Below plus one to drive accelerated growth in technology and value added services, businesses, and specialty products. Projected to grow operating income faster than distribution business. That makes sense, right? This is a very uh, slow moving business. I mean, they have built it, they're good at it, and it's a good foundation. And if they are going after e commerce, if they are going after, um, you know, the uh, high tech side, you know, that makes a lot of sense. But at the same, you know, on the flip side, if you think about if their business is distribution, uh, how disruptive is that if their customers are going to Amazon, they're going to these other online e-commerce stores, um, that is a very disruptive, um, you know, alternative to their business model. And I think the e-commerce is a more of a defensive play than anything else uh, for long-term sustainability and the, you know, and uh, Shine One, which is the uh, medical records or you know, practice management software, that is more of an opportunistic play, uh, which a much faster growth trajectory, and that could really transform uh, the business overall. Uh, projected operating income contribution of 40%. Okay, so what does that mean? Specialty technology and value added services is at 32% in 2019, and projected to be 40% at 2022. So that's a you know very good rate of change given the size of revenue that they're at. Um, so let's see what happens in the next few months and years. Financial summary, here we have the, all right, so we have the non-GAAP projected operating income growth in high. Okay, so we talked about that. Long-term annual sales, we talked about that. Uh, we talked about the 40% uh, for technology and value added services as well on the previous slide. Okay, so now is Q&A. Um, Okay, so we've covered all of this in the previous as well. Okay, so I think that is it. And these are some um, gap to non-gap reconciliation. Uh, we'll take a closer look at the financials uh, as a next step if we think it makes sense. Uh, overall, you know, I think the opinion on, uh, or the opinion I have on this company right now is that uh, they have a very solid foundational business, which is in distribution space, and they have a really good uh, customer base, they have a really good geographic um, reach, they have uh, infrastructure in place, and that's a solid business in, you know, at least in the short term. But I think they also see the writing on the wall where e-commerce is a disruptor to their business, right? I mean, distribution is not a very um, high tech space, you know, at least at face value, right? But they have the infrastructure on the transportation, they have the manufacturing facilities, they have the uh, distribution. Um, so I think it's how do they protect the next 10, 20 years uh, with e-commerce? And at the same time, how do they provide more value to their customers through technology, through other value-added services, uh, and really become a partner to not just industry, which is 
uh, seems like they're bread and butter uh, for the most part, but how do they also enter into the medical space? So I'd be curious to understand and see how their share price have performed, how their revenue has performed over the past few years uh, in light of COVID, in light of supply chain disruptions. Uh, and overall, you know, I think this is a good company with a solid base. And if the upside on the operational front is, you know, if the execution happens well, uh, there could potentially be a lot of upside, especially if the valuation is favorable, right? So, you know, I think let's take a look at you know, their financials. Let's take a look at uh, a very quick and dirty, um, you know, DCF on, um, you know, on the company with the five-year projection, and you know, see if their current share price is. Uh, undervalued, overvalued, or very valued. Okay, so here we have uh, a very quick and dirty uh, financial model for Henry Schein. Uh, so I pulled the, uh, some really high level numbers from their uh, 10Ks over the past few years from 2018 to 2022. So we have the net sales, cost of sales, uh, gross profit. Uh, right, so that's, um, yeah, that's net. And then we have Auburn. And we have net income. And then we have cash flow from operations, which is reported. And we have uh, purchases of fixed assets, so we're not accounting for a lot of the uh, financing cash flows. We're you know we're not accounting for acquisitions because the way that I'm logically thinking about this is you know what is the uh, what is the growth rate of the company over the next five years if they continue business their current business as is, um, right? So we're not talking about any more acquisitions or any sort of inorganic um, actions that could really bolster the company, right? We're not thinking about any sort of M and A. We're not thinking about um, you know, surprise partnerships that could really bring or destroy shareholder value. So we're just assuming base case, the company, you know, continues as is, uh, and it maintains the investment of current fixed assets uh, on average over the past five years at seventy-four million dollars per annum uh, into the future. Uh, we have an effective tax rate of twenty-three point five percent over the five years, and we have, um, I think, we have about one point one million dollars of debt, uh, long-term debt on the books in a form of revolver, um, right, so that would be more short-term, but you know that's a revolver, private placement, and uh, receivable securitization, right? So we have about uh, 1.1 million, sorry, 1.1 billion dollars of debt on the books at an effective cost of 4.1%. Um, so let's just double check to see if that makes sense. Okay, so it's actually 46 uh, billion. So actually, let's... Uh, yeah, let's just update that. Okay, so what we're trying to calculate here is the free cash flow to firm. So we're going to be calculating the enterprise value of it, of the company, uh, and we're going to reduce it by uh, the amount of debt it has to calculate the market capitalization. Right. So here we have, uh, and how we're forecasting is using the uh, net of sales growth. So we have starting off at nine point five percent. Uh, and then we're reducing it by 25% per annum, right? So there's a de de deterioration of 25 per annum uh, into year five. And then we have cost of sales as a percentage of the sales at 70%, and we're going to increase it, uh, or we're going to reduce the percentage, uh, we're improve it by a 2.5% uh, increase uh, year over year. So as the company moves to more higher margin products and services, technology-based services, um, obviously the margins are going to increase. Uh, so that's why the cost of sales as a percentage of net sales is decreasing uh, over the years. Uh, we're, and then for operating income, very quick and you know, dirty and fast way, we're just going to take the average um, you know, percentage of operating income as a percentage of gross profit. Right? So we're just going to do that division and hold a constant across the five years. Uh, and then for net income, we're going to calculate it as a percentage of the operating income on average over the past five years and keep it constant over the next five years. And then the cash flow from operations we're going to keep it as a um, right as a uh, percentage of net income uh, on average from the past four years to the next uh, five years, right? And the only reason why I did that is you know we're just missing the tax rate for 2018. I think in four years I think it's you know, it's it, it's sufficient for our purposes for now, right? So now we have the cash flow from operations, uh, and then we would subtract the fixed uh, or really the capex. We add back the interest rate uh, with this tax shield, and then we, and that's how we get to the free cash flow. Uh, from, right. So this is the nominal value over the next five years, and then we have the discount factor, uh, and that is the discount factor is uh, being discounted by the WAC. Right. So the weighted cost of uh, weighted average cost of capital 
uh, and how we are doing it is first we calculate the cost of equity and we do that by looking at the data uh, right and we can calculate this on our own uh, i pulled this from you know online source uh, i think it was i can't remember exactly which one but it's beta where it's sensitivity to the market uh, which is SP 500 is 0 0.83 or past six months to risk free rate uh, on i believe is the 10 year uh, treasury note we're looking at about nine four point nine one percent equity risk premium uh, as of October 1st, 2023, we're looking at about 4.47%. Uh, so, and taking a cap uh, model, um, how we calculate the cost of equity is the risk free rate plus the beta times the equity risk premium to get 8.26% as the cost of equity. And then for the cost of debt, so this is, um, yeah, so I believe this is the amount outstanding for these two years uh, that I pulled from the financial statement. Um, so here is the total, and these are the effective uh, average interest, interest rates for the line of credit. And then, you know, this is the amount that was outstanding for uh, the private placement and the trade receivable securitizations. So I'm taking the most recent one from 2022, right? And from, you know, we're looking at a, you know, what is that percentage as a percentage of the total liabilities? Uh, Right here, and then we found the effective interest rates uh, as reported in the financial statements. Uh, right, so it's uh, two point nine percent for private placement, and then it's, I believe, yeah, four point five eight eight five percent for uh, the receivable securitizations, and we just multiply it by the percentage of uh, its percentage as of the total liabilities to calculate the effective interest rate. And we just sum that to get the weighted average total cost of debt, and uh, there you have it, right? So that's the weighted cost of, or yeah, that's the weighted cost of debt. So the total market capitalization right now, as of uh, October 2022, we're looking at uh, 8.92 billion dollars, and with about 1.13 billion dollars of debt outstanding. Uh, so that means, um, and there wasn't any sort of preferred shares on the equity portion of their income statement. Uh, sorry, of uh, in the equity portion of their balance sheets. Uh, in your most recent 10Q, so or 10K, so now the percentage is really uh, percentage equity weight of the total uh, enterprise value is 88.74%. Uh, so we just multiply, um, yeah. So we just multiply the cost of equity by its weight, and then we multiply and we plus uh, the debt portion and multiplying it by and reducing it by the tax shield of 23.5% to get a total. Uh, whack of 8% pretty much, right? So now here we have 8% uh, being discounted and then Right, so that's just the discount factor uh, And I guess to 1.47 and they, so how we get the discounted free cash flow to firm is dividing the free cash flow generated in that year divided by the discount factor and then for the terminal value what we're doing here is uh, we are growing the terminal year uh, valuation or the terminal year free cash flow by the terminal year growth rate to get to year six. And then we are discounting it uh, by the WAC minus the growth rate again. Right. And then that gets us about a terminal value of $10 billion. And with the 10 billion, uh, we add that to the free cash flow. And that, you know, when we sum it, that is the sum of the total discounted. Uh, free cash flows assuming an exit in year five and we get 13.976 billion dollars as a uh, enterprise value or as a valuation uh, and then how we get the price per share is we take the valuation or enterprise value multiply uh, subtract it by the total debt outstanding and we're assuming that you know with the distributions in free cash flow that is that has been distributed as a form of free cash flow multiplied by a thousand and divided by the total uh, shares outstanding to get a share price of 20, uh, or to get a share price of $93.23. And uh, I mean, the numbers here that you're seeing is actually formatted to be a certain way. So this is actually 770, uh, $747 million, but the way I'm formatting it is uh, just to show the million. So that's why uh, here you're only multiplying by a thousand instead of uh, instead of a million. So. Uh, what that implies is that the current net income in 2022 
uh, fiscal year end, we're looking at about a 23.87 uh, uh, PE ratio at the implied intrinsic share price, whereas the current share price as of October 20, um, or the Friday of October 22nd, 2023, we're looking at 60 Eight percent at thirty-one cents, which shows an implied P ratio of uh, seventeen point five times. So here we have the current share price as of October twenty-second, twenty twenty-three, of sixty-eight dollars and thirty-one cents, which implies a P ratio of seventeen point five times uh, compared to the fiscal year twenty twenty-three uh, or twenty twenty-two net income. Uh, it also means that it is currently undervalued. By about 26 percent so i think uh, with these very rough numbers it does uh, trigger uh, you know that it's worth uh, looking more into right especially if the cost of capital is at eight uh, percent right because uh, a lot of the i mean the biggest source of the whack right now is coming from the cost of equity so the risk free rate is uh, you know it's quite high you know i think it's uh, you know i think some people are saying that it is going to be reduced in the coming months were in 2024 by mid 2024 to maybe late 2024 uh same thing for equity risk premium if these both go down uh the cost of equity will go down you know in proportion and uh there's also not a lot of debt right if they are generating a good amount of cash flow as they are right now and they only have you know almost a you know what is it so it's one uh, 1.1 billion dollars and they have about five hundred thousand or six hundred thousand dollars of Operating cash flow, or let's just say 500, uh, you're looking at a two to one ratio of debt to uh, free, you know, operating cash flow, which is a uh, you know not too bad. So you know, I think they could afford a bit more debt, lower the cost of capital, and as the cost of equity comes down, you know, we're looking at a much smaller discount factor, which really you know could really bring the share price up if we're looking at it from a discount cash flow perspective. Uh, so overall, I think you know this is the really rough back of the napkin uh, valuation model for Henry Schein, but you know, let's take a closer look and see if it is worth to invest in. How do we invest? Right? Do we just go long or are there other option strategies that we can use to manage our risk, cover calls, right? To sell off some of the really high upside that we don't think is gonna happen and reduce the cost basis of your investment. Um, so yeah, let's take a closer look in uh, in the next video.